Let's take a look at the large intestine. Now, remember what's large about the large intestine is the diameter, right? It's a whole lot shorter than what the small intestine is. So again, you got to think diameter when you think about that small and large intestine. Well, the small intestine was about 17 feet long. The large is about four and a half. Now, we said in the small intestine, about 92% of all materials going through the digestive tract would be absorbed there. Where here you get about another six to seven percent. So that means only around 1% of the material going through this tract gets lost every day. Now, this starts way back at the very end of the ileum, which remember was at the last part of the small intestine. And the first part of the large intestine is called the cecum. So what's called the ileocecal junction, that's where it begins, and all the way to the end of the digestive tract at the anus. So start with the cecum down in the lower right quadrant of the abdomen, and that's where the appendix is found. If there's ever intense pain down in that lower right quadrant, that appendix could be what's causing that. And the appendix is thought acts as a helpful reservoir for bacteria, nice friendly bacteria that live in our large intestine. But the problem is sometimes it may get clogged up. All that bacteria continue to grow and it swells and it could rupture. And if the contents in there spill out into the abdominal cavity, that could cause problems leading up to and including death. But after that cecum in the lower right quadrant, you want to enter the next section called the colon. And the first part to it is the ascending colon. Now you start down in the lower right quadrant and this colon comes up. That's why they call it the ascending. It's gonna hit the bottom of your liver and turn to the left. So since that's over on the right side of your body, that's called the right hepatic flexure. Now the colon's gonna come across you. Trans means across in Latin. So it's gonna go from the right side of you to your liver, across into the back to your spleen. Now, where it comes across, the transverse comes way over to the back posterior to your spleen. It's going to turn and go down. And over on the left, that's going to be the left splenic flexure. But now it's going downwards. We got descending colon coming down the left side of your abdomen. And then it moves medially, making somewhat of an S shape. And that's the sigmoid colon. Then right there, medially, there'll be the rectum, anal canal, and right on out the body. And even though the large intestine is much shorter than what the small is, material moves through the large intestine a whole lot slower. It takes longer for material to go through the large than what it does that longer small, somewhere around 18 to 24 hours for movement through the large intestine. And here the chyme or chyme that we saw in the stomach will be converted, converted to feces. Now what the function of the large intestine is, is to pick up most all the remaining water. It does that by reabsorbing salts. Where the sodium is pumped, the chloride will follow and the water will follow them. So picking up most all that remaining water is what that large intestine is really about. Of course, you still got mucus here, anywhere through the uh, digestive tract, you will, and lots of helpful microorganisms. We give them a nice little home and they provide us with things that we need. So somewhere around 1,500 milliliters of this chyme enters the cecum. Probably at least 90% of that's going to be reabsorbed, resulting in about 80 to 150 milliliters of feces a day. So again, if we go back to the beginning of the large intestine, that's that cecum. Lower right quadrant, got the appendix down there. Then you come upwards, right? So that's the first part of the colon, the ascending. Then it comes across to the left, transverse, down descending and then medially sigmoid, that's just sections to the colon right there. And of course that large intestine is made mostly of muscle, but there's also three tape-like long uh, thin pieces called the tinea coli, more super superficial to the outside. And due to that muscle contraction, the large intestine is broken up in individual pouches. You can see one segment after another, and each one of those little pouches is called a hostra. You'll also see epiploic appendages. It's just accumulations of adipose tissue. Nothing surprising about that. Most internal organs will have adipose tissue around them. And of course, you've always got your goblet cells making the mucus. Again, you get to the end of the colon, there's a rectum, somewhat of a straight muscular tube. And that's another place where baroreceptors. The feces fills this rectum and it stretches out and distends baroreceptors detect that pressure and stretching. That's when we need to go uh, relieve ourselves of this material. Lastly, the anal canal, and there towards the end, there's a couple of sphincter muscles. There's an internal, which is smooth, and an external, which is skeletal. But in this rectum region right here, and especially this anal canal at the end, is where hemorrhoids may form.
hearts where veins have become inflamed and swollen and pain and such results from that. So again, we've mentioned the mucus all the way through the digestive tract. Again, that's goblet cells producing this. And again, that's under parasympathetic stimulation there. There's pumps with bacteria and such producing acid. They'll also have some bicarbonate on being swapped out for chloride and sodium for hydrogen. Lots of bacterial action. Again, helpful bacteria provide us with things we need like vitamin K. We provide them with a home and the things they need. But they also produce gases, which are called flatus. So at the end of this digestive tract, here at the very end of the large intestine, again, we'll see the chyme or the chyme converted into feces as most all that remaining water is pulled out. It should still be a small amount. And of course, there'll be any undigestible food, cellulose from the cell wall of plants is just one thing as an example. Lots of microorganisms and epithelial cells, which have been lost all throughout the digestive tract. Contraction of the smooth muscle in this large intestine is called mass movements because the muscle tends to work together in a coordinated fashion. And all this muscle is primarily being controlled by that enteric plexus. It's one of those three divisions of that autonomic nervous system. And what really signals these mass movements is food entering the stomach or the duodenum. So that's why you'll see gastrocolic reflexes initiated by the stomach, the gastro for stomach, Tells you where those are starting, and the duodenocolic initiated by the duodenum also cause these reflexes to happen, causing that mass movement, moving the previous meal out of the way as another comes along. And then again, lastly, here with the defecation reflex, distension, stretching of that rectal wall as it fills with feces is what's causing this. Again, barrel receptors sending action potentials back to our brain lets us know with our conscious thought this is happening. Again, it's under parasympathetic stimulation right there. And of course, there's some voluntary action along with it. But if material moves through the large intestine too fast, it can't do its job and reabsorb most of that remaining water. Well, when there's too much water in the feces, that's diarrhea. But material might also move through the large intestine too slowly. If that happens, too much water gets reabsorbed. And constipation is the end result there. So again, there's somewhere around nine liters of material going into the digestive tract every day. About two of it comes in through the oral cavity. About seven liters are secreted. And since most of that seven is water, we've got to reabsorb most of that material. Somebody loses a very large amount of water out of the digestive tract. They can become dehydrated very fast. But again, of that nine liters, most of it's reabsorbed in the small intestine remaining water, at least most of it in the large, and only about 1% of that material will be lost with feces. So if we look down here at the bottom, here's our ileum, the very end of the small intestine where it meets the cecum. There's the appendix, and again, that's down in the lower right quadrant. But then again, there's the ascending colon, hits the bottom of your liver, so there's your right hepatic flexure. Comes across, there's the transverse colon, back here to your spleen. So there's the left splenic flexure, comes down, descending colon, and then sigmoid, and then rectum, anal canal, and right on out the body. So a couple of different pictures illustrating that here. 